Well, good morning, church. How is everybody doing today? Fantastic. Well, what a privilege it is as you grab your seat this morning. What a privilege it is to bring the word to you, to share the message. I think I've got my mom watching online. I've got my firstborn sitting in the front row, so the pressure is on. But what I believe I'm going to share this morning, I think it's going to make us think a little bit. Maybe it could challenge some of us, but my goal and my hope at the end of this message is that we'll all look at ourselves a little bit differently. Amen? Let's pray. Jesus, we commit this time into your hands. We know that you're here, so we pray that let every word spoken bring life and hope. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. can't even imagine that God would leave us hanging without any divine plans, no appointments, no purpose, no agendas? Absolutely not. I believe that for every single person sitting here, for everyone watching online this morning, I do believe that God has a list of divine appointments, and against every single one of them, He has put your name on it. It may not feel like it, but that's what He's done. So this morning, we're going to spend a few minutes looking at a few stories from the Bible. Now, if some of you, as you heard the sermon title, you would have thought, oh, she's going to talk about Moses. If you did, five points. You can grab a crunchy after the service. The first name that always comes to mind is Moses. So kicking us off is Exodus chapter 4. Here is the scene. God and Moses are having a little interaction. Verse 1. Moses responds to God and says, what if they don't believe me or listen to me? What if they say, the Lord never appeared to you? Then God looks at Moses and you know what he says? What's in your hand? And Moses says, I've got a shepherd's staff with a little duck thingy on it. So God says, throw it on the ground. So Moses throws down the staff, and it turns into a snake. And Moses jumped back. You know, some of the Bible translation says that Moses ran away. So God had to say, hey, mate, can you please come back here and grab the snake by its tail? So Moses reached out and grabbed it, and it turned back into a shepherd's staff in his hands. When we look at Moses, some, some of us here might write him off. He might say he's a failure. You see, Moses had killed an Egyptian. He was not very good at public speaking. And I'm pretty sure God, when he was having this little interaction that we just read about, God knew all about it. But also, God knew what he was about to do. He was just getting ready to interrupt a very uncomfortable life. God that day spoke out of a burning bush. It's 2022. I don't know if any, any of you have like burning bush experience in the backyard or in the middle of your living room. But what we do have is the Bible. And you know what the Bible does? It reminds us 
every single day of all the things that we can do. There is a verse in the Bible that is often quoted and we remind our children about it when they're feeling a bit low. And it was put in almost every other sermon. It's in Philippians chapter 4, 13. And I want all of us out loud right now to confess it and declare it. Are you ready? It says this, for everything to Christ who gives me it's, it's what it's in our hands that God is going to take and make divine appointments. You know, when God picked out Moses or even any other man or woman uh, in the Bible, I'll give this back. You all are checking out my stick. He didn't look at, you know, what they had done. He didn't look at their job history. He didn't look at their credentials. He didn't pick up the phone and make two to three reference calls before he handed them the offer letter. He saw what he had put in his hands. How many of you believe this morning that God has put something in your hands that cannot fail? I wonder if Moses, you know, that particular morning before Exodus chapter 4 happened, he woke up, brushed his teeth, drank, you know, his cup of black tea, ate a falafel sandwich, and as he grabbed this staff, do you think he would have thought for a second that one day the staff, the shepherd's staff was going to become the rod of God that would bring down, humble, and take out this greatest nation of his time? Do you think that morning as he grabbed that stick, he would have thought that I'm going to walk to the River Nile and when I'm going to dip it into it, it's going to turn into blood. Did you think that, you know, this shepherd's staff would become the rod of God, that he would bring the plagues of Egypt in? I don't think he would have even thought about that for a second. But what he had in his hand was a miracle. You know, too often we look at everybody else's hands, right? I might look at someone my age and say, how come she owns three houses and I don't? You know, I might look, like, look at this person and go, how come that person is so good at, you know, business and I keep failing? Sometimes on a Saturday, I look out of my kitchen window and I look at my neighbor's backyard and it looks so beautiful. It looks green. Mine looks green too, but I, also, I see the weeds in mine. So I call Kingsley and I say, look at the neighbor's backyard. And you know what he says? He says the distance between that kitchen window and that backyard is so far away that if I was to actually go and stand on my neighbor's property and look down at the grass, I might find a weed. But I waste a lot of time. I think he's getting out of lawn mowing. That's a different thing. But the phrase, but the, what he said really is useful for this message, right? So how do we use our hands? Exodus chapter 17. Okay, we're going to look at a story. The Israelites were in a battle with the Amalekites, and Moses looks at Joshua, who's going to lead this army. They're going to fight this, you know, uh, this opponent. And in verse 11, we see that as long as Moses' hands were raised, that the Israelites were winning. But every time he lowered his hands, the Amalekites would win. And so Moses, uh, you know, he had his hands up. Can you all imagine raising your hands the whole time? Because he knew that as long as he held his hand, they were going to win. But eventually, hands grew tired, and so he had two friends in his team, which is really cool, Aaron and Hur. They saw that Moses was struggling, and so they bring this rock, and they tell Moses, can you please sit on this rock? And then you know what Aaron did? He went on one side, and he held his hand up. And then Hur went on the other side, and Hur held the hand up. And then we see that Israel won. Verse 13, Joshua overcame the Amalekite army with the sword. And so point number one, if you are taking notes this morning, which I hope you are, what is going to make me victorious is prayer. Can you say that with me? What is going to make me victorious is prayer. As long as their hands were up, raised up to the sky in faith, they were winning. Another great example is this. At the Red Sea, Moses is looking eye to eye at his impossible situation. How many of you are sitting here with an impossible situation, a negative challenge? Some of us are sitting there, right? It's not easy. But we see in Exodus 14 verse 21 that Moses raised his hand over the sea and the Lord opened up a path through the water with a strong east wind. 
And the wind blew all night. We're all from Wellington. We all know the sound of that wind. You know, that wind was so strong that it turned the seabed into dry land. So that the people of Israel walked through the middle of the sea on dry ground with water on each side. Can you all imagine that scene? You've seen it in movies, right? So what does this say? Even when we are faced with impossible challenges, even when we are going through a really hard time, the seas can part. When God looks at every single one of us here, he looks at us as a winner. He wants us to be the winner. Amen? So verse 2. What is going to make me successful is in my hands. Look at your hands. What is going to make me successful is in my hands. Let's look at Moses one more time. Exodus 17. Here he is, right, re leading thousands and thousands of Israelites through the desert. And if you know in a desert, you can't really find water. It's just really dry and hot. And so here are a bunch of people murmuring about the lack of water and murmuring about all the things that are wrong and not looking at what God's doing. And so Moses goes to God. Now, if you look at the life of Moses and all of the incidents that have happened and the interactions that he has had with God, you see that every single time Moses goes to God and, you know, blurts out this problem and says all these people are bad, God responds and says, hey, Moses, what's in your hand? Or he'll say, hey, Moses, grab the thing that I've given you. Let's go. And so that's what he did even here. Verse 5, he tells Moses, go out in front of the people. And he says, take a few church elders with you and look at what I'm about to do. Verse 6, he says, I will stand there before you by the rock of Horab. Strike the rock and water will come out of it for the people to drink. I like how it says, God didn't say, I'll stand next to you or I'll stand behind you. But he says, I will stand before you even at this impossible challenge. Sometimes we've got to keep hitting that rock. We've got to keep praying. Praying. We've got to keep pushing. We've got to keep, you know, holding up that hands in faith and believe that God can split a rock, that God can, you know, split up an ocean and we never give up. Because you know what, friend, you will never know what that small little thing that God has placed in your hand is about to make a huge difference. Thank you. Love it. John chapter 6, let's move on to the New Testament. Another cool story, if you've been to Sunday school as a little child, you would have heard your Sunday school teacher talk about this boy with his little lunch. You see, his mom had taken his bento lunchbox that morning and put in five pieces of whole meat, whole wheat, pita bread. I'm saying whole wheat because if I say you know, white bread, you all will come and tell me all. Multi-grain, okay? We're being healthy. Those are the mini pockets, pita pockets. And then in the next little compartment, she put two fish fingers. And I'm sure she would have put hummus and, you know, some black olives and maybe Lebanese cucumbers so her son could make a little pita pocket for lunch. So after this day, here they are. Jesus has preached to thousands of people. And Jesus is a great host. So he's looking at his disciples and he's saying, hey, look at all these young families who have come. I would love to give them something. You've got a crunchy, anything. Let's just give something in their hand so they'll have a little bit of food in their tummy and they can go home. But of course, the disciples start talking about inflation, recession, increase in prices. And one disciple goes, you know, Jesus, yesterday I went to New World and two tomatoes were $7. I don't think we can buy anything for these people. But there was this boy with his little lunch. He heard about it and he offered his lunch. You know what? This boy didn't know that when his little lunch got in the hands of Jesus Christ, it multiplied. So when we give our tithes and offerings every week, fortnightly, monthly, we need to start believing God to multiply it. You know, all around we go right now, and even in my home, from my home to my work, even on the bus, people are talking about recession. People are talking about tough financial times. People are talking about, you know, saving and not drinking coffee out every day. I, I hear that every single day, but I still go do it anyways. But, you know, people keep doing that, but I want to encourage you. Can you trust God with your finances? You know, this little boy, he didn't know that when the lunch would, you know, make room for him. His lunch was about to make room for him. That was his gift. He gave it to God, and he saw how God could multiply it. That day, his little lunch served lunch to 5,000 people. And Jesus, you know, was a, a good steward of 
wherever he was, the place that he had you know, used, he made sure his disciples cleaned up the place, picked up the leftover food. And it's, we read in the Bible that they filled up 12 baskets full of leftover food. So the food, uh, the food that Jesus had multiplied didn't just feed 5,000 people. It could have probably fed a lot more people. Amen. Number three, my gift makes room for me. We're now going to look at two scriptures from uh, the Bible. And it talks about how we can use our hands for good work. So the first one is Ephesians 4.38. I'm going to read the second sentence in that. It says, use your hands for good hard work and then give generously to others in need. The second verse is from Ecclesiastes 9.10. Whatever your hand finds to do, do it with all your might. And then it goes on to say that once you're dead, there is no working, no planning, no strategizing, no decluttering, no organizing. So do everything you can when you've got breath in your nostrils, right? Work hard. So church, it's time to look at the advantages that God has placed in us. Not look down upon us. Not keep comparing, you know, looking at how this person is doing, even though we studied the same thing. We've got to look at what God has placed in our hands and, you know, let God release us. So how do we apply these two scriptures in our week that's coming up? When you show up at work tomorrow, if you're at home tomorrow with the kids or you're at an internship or you're volunteering or whatever you're doing tomorrow, all right, this week, let's not be sloppy at what we do. When someone hands a job to us, let's do it with excellence. You know, let's give our 100%. And I know on a Monday morning, the temptation is to, you know, go for about 10,000 morning teas because we're you know, suffering from Monday-itis. And we're catching up with people that by the time we actually do any work, it's 1 p.m. But why not we be that person that when we show up, turn on that laptop or show, show up at our work and whatever we're doing, bam, we're on it. You know, we're all procrastinating. We're giving it our 100%. And I know we might be in some jobs where, you know, people are not recognizing us. We might do the hard work, but there's someone sitting above us getting all the credit. You all have been there? Yeah. Our name never comes up. But you know what? God is watching. And I want to encourage you to keep at it. Don't give up just yet. Because God will use the same team leader, same supervisor, same manager. Maybe God might even use the CEO of your organization and they'll walk up to you and say, hey, you know what? Here is your pay rise. This is your promotion. We see how you've been working. Amen? So I want you to turn to your neighbor one more time. Remember the same neighbor, okay? Same neighbor. Don't find a new neighbor. And say this, hey, neighbor. Look at my hands. The Bible says there are miracles in my hands. Come on, we need to say that a bit louder, okay? Now, you know what to say, right? The Bible says there are miracles in my hands. Church, did you know that what is in your hand, no matter how small it is, if you feel like, or no matter how okay it is, that is what God put in your hands. And when we keep, you know, being diligent with that, and we keep showing up, you know, you'll be so surprised that God will put you in the right place, in the right room, in front of the right people. And you will never know how you got, I mean, you will know eventually, but you know, you'll be sitting there going, how am I here? And then deep down in the voice, your voice, your conscience will say, you know what? You got here because of God. It was not you. Jesus brought you to this place. So I'll be willing this morning to let go of that little thing that's on our hands that God has put in there and say, God, you can take it, you can use it and release it so that, you know what, God can multiply it just like what he did with that little bento lunchbox. I mean, can you imagine for a second, right? Let's, let's talk about our friend Moses. Like, can you imagine for a second Moses, you know, wakes up and you see all these stories where God is saying, Moses, take up your staff. Moses, you know, stick the staff in the water. Moses, do this. Grab it. And if Moses said, God, I'm feeling so blah and bloated. I'm about to take this Gaviscon pill. Why don't we do this at 2 o'clock? If that was his response. Can you imagine for a second? Or, you know, he wakes up, looks at the mirror, and you can see 
dark circles under his eyes. Hair is so frizzy. No matter what hair product you're putting down, it's going to go boof, right? And he says, God, can we do it tomorrow? I just don't look good. I just need to have a pajama day. If, if Moses had said that, do you think he would have been able to take his you know, nation, his people out to their promised land? No. You know, when I was working on this message, I was reminded of this story. Because I know all these people are in the Bible. Let me talk, tell you about someone I know who used his hands to just not be really good at his work. But also he used the little thing that God had put in his hand to touch his community. So the person I want to tell you about is my grandfather. So my, my mom's dad who's watching today, right? My mom's dad. So his name is Ethelbert Salvaraj. And he married my grandma when, you know, she moved out of Sri Lanka at 17, I think. And her name is Thangam, which translates to gold. So they both lived during the time when India was under the British rule. So my granddad's work was in electrical engineering, right? So this is the days of no health and safety. So they would make the guys go up these electric poles, nothing on, like a monkey, you go up, and then you go and work on these wires. You don't know if the wires are alive. You just got to use a lot of faith. But my granddad stuck at it. He was diligent, and then he wanted to, you know, do well at his job. And so he learned that the secret to getting, you know, up, up a level is to learn the English language. And so he did that, and he told his workmates, hey, want some favor? Learn the language. So my granddad that does this, and I think he finished up at his work when one day some of his workmates and him went up, live wire, they touch, they get thrown off or fallen off. He retires, right? So what does my granddad do? Does he sit around and lounge on the lazy boy because he's retired and get a suntan? No. He used what God had put in his little hand. He was a hard worker. He knew how to fix anything. He was like Craig, if you want to imagine. You see something, Craig will fix it. Right? And the next thing you go pray for somebody. That was my granddad. And so he went out. Here's what my granddad did. Uh, Monday through Friday. If you are in your 20s, listen to this. Monday through Friday, my granddad, I think, woke up around 4.30 in the morning or 5. Something around that. That's a bit early, right? And he, what he did was out of our home, he had an electrical engineering background. Remember that? He knew how to wire everything in our house. And on top of the, our home, our two-story home, he erected these speakers to face in different direction of our suburb. And around five-ish in the morning, when all of the mothers would wake up and, you know, get their milk delivered and they'd boil the milk, make the breakfast, make the lunches, bake up their, you know, college and university kids to study and finish the projects, my granddad would be sharing a morning devotion to his suburb from our home. Play a song, all right, a worship song. He wouldn't sing. He would play it. He had to organize a sermon. And this suburb was not a Christian suburb. Christians were probably minorities. Nobody complained because that's when everybody woke up. But when the ladies would walk past our house, and if they would see my grandma, they would say, thanks, that was really helpful. You know, it helped my day, blah, blah, blah. And he would do that. So that was Monday to Friday. Saturday came, no sleeping in. He woke up in the morning, and you know what he did? He and his friend, I don't know his a friend's name, but everybody called him the professor. Now, don't let your head wander. Don't let your head wander to that show. So the professor was like my granddad's GPS. He knew where to go. But you know what these, these two guys did? They would load up this little bike with all of this equipment that my granddad had welded and put together speakers, a microphone, and they would go village after village. It was every week was a village. And my granddad would go to these places and, you know, be amongst these people that nobody would go to. You know, they didn't know, um, they had no education, they were poor, they were illiterate. They, but he would go and preach and teach them about Jesus in the way that they could understand. Sometimes he would dance, sometimes he would do a drama, sometimes he would just share his lunch. And, you know, he would pray over all of their livestock, the chickens, the buffaloes, the, the cows. He would pray over the rice paddy fields and stuff like that. Why? Because that was their livelihood. And if anyone was out of line with, and was not, you know, treating his wife properly or they were drinking too much, he set them straight. 
2000 and so this was like Monday, uh, till, that was Saturday. Sunday, he didn't sleep in again. He showed up at his local church. He wasn't an elder. He wasn't there. He sat towards the back, attended it. And then like Pastor Boyd says, he would go home and take a Sunday nap. Monday comes, starts again. 2009, he passed away. Two weeks prior to that, I think, he did his last village ministry. And, you know, he came home and passed away. Now, he dies, and in India, when you get married, thousands show up. You don't even know who's showing up at your wedding. People show up. When you, when you pass away, the same thing happens. Even the guy who has ironed your shirt will show up to pay his respects. And our family noticed that there were so many people in that place who they had never met, who were not family, but they learned that day that my granddad had gone with his professor friend to every village all from the bottom of the city that they were living in, which was Madurai, the south of India, had heard the gospel of Jesus through my granddad. The reason why I'm sharing this is to not make him cool or me cool. But the reason why I'm sharing this is because my granddad had a tiny little something in his hand. But he did everything that he could till his very end. So let's summarize, just in case you forgot. Number one. Remember what was in Moses' hand changed a nation. When Moses lifted his hand, the Red Sea parted. When Moses struck the rock a few times, he didn't tap it, he struck it a few times, the water came gushing out. Remember that boy with his little lunch? He didn't know that we would be reading about him thousands of years later. And so when it comes to our work this week, let's remember to work with excellence. And finally... There are miracles in our hands. So how do we win this week? How do we win this week? You know, for some of us, it might just be, you know, giving a heart to Jesus for the first time. Or maybe it's a recommitment. You know, you're sitting here going, you know what? My relationship is a little bit sloppy. I could do better at what, you know, I'm doing right now with God. And so what we're going to do is we're all going to say the same prayer. And I'm just going to say it. We're going to repeat it. And we're going to pray. And it might be a first-time commitment. It might be, you know, the 10th time you're praying this prayer. It's all right. Are you ready? Let's pray. Father, I know that you love me. I know you sent Jesus to die for me. I know you have a plan for me. Good plans not bad plans. I repent of the, all the bad things that I've done. I invite you, Jesus, to come into my heart and be the Lord of my life. I thank you, Jesus, that I have in my hand the ability for miracles. I have in my hand what can multiply a need in my hands the ability to do good. In Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. Well, church, if you prayed that prayer for the first time or the hundredth time, I just want to congratulate you for making that decision and you know, putting your hand into God's hand. And I'm actually going to invite Pastor Mitch right now so she can talk us to the next step.